Come, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you as we come around your word today. We are children. We are thankful for what you are doing, Lord God. We thank you that no matter what we face in our lives, Father, you are Lord over the circumstance. That there is nothing above the name of Jesus. That every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. There is no demon in hell that can stand to the name of Jesus. And we thank you for the freedom in being a Christian. We thank you, Lord God, for the freedom and the liberty of being your children. We stand on that today, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you the praise, the worship, and the honor. And God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Give somebody a high five next to you, and you may take your seats. Amen. Hallelujah. That was such a sad high five. I don't know what happened. It's like, it's okay. It's all right. I'll forgive you. But if this was Liverpool and Manchester United, it's either going to be war or it's going to be a celebration with the person next to you. Amen. Turn with me to Psalms 27 verses number 1, please. Psalms 27. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Today, I want to continue on what we spoke about last week. Last week, we spoke about vision, we spoke about mission, and we spoke about purpose. But today, specifically, I want to deal with vision. Psalms chapter 27, verses 1 to 6. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? When evil men come to devour me, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and they will fail. Say hallelujah. Though a mighty army surround me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek the most, is to live in the house of the Lord forever. To live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in His temple. For He will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me there in His sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. And his sanctuary, at his sanctuary, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Brothers and sisters, in a single moment, in one moment in time, the Lord can turn everything around. These moments can be life-changing. From the moment that we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, this was life-changing. To the time that you chose your husband or your wife can be life-changing. The moment that you found out that you were pregnant, to the moment that your child was born, these things make a tremendous impact on who we are as God's people. The moment that you get your first job. The moment that after not having worked for a while to suddenly get that first job. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. The moment that you were taking a taxi. That you knew every sign to get everywhere because all you have known is a taxi. And you suddenly buy your very first car. The moment that you were renting And the moment that you bought your own house. Do you realize that it only takes one moment for your whole entire life to change? God works in moments. Hallelujah. And in these moments, our lives are never the same again. In one moment, prayers can be answered. In other moments, we wait And then suddenly healing comes. Breakthrough comes just the same. 
you receive a miracle in a moment, in one instance in time. God can change everything around. Hallelujah. If you're looking for a miracle today, brothers and sisters, this can be that moment. If you're looking for financial breakthrough, this can be that moment. If you're looking for a job, brothers and sisters, this can be that moment. If you are looking for reconciliation in your marriage, because you've not seen eye to eye, this can be that moment. All it takes is one instance with God, and it can change. When we look at Acts chapter 16, Paul was in prison. But in a moment, it suddenly changed. In chapter 16, verses 26, it says, Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains were loosed. And in that moment, God loosed Paul's chains and Paul received a breakthrough where he had been bound for so long, and suddenly the whole prison was free because of that one moment with God. In Acts chapter 2, verses 2, it says, When in a moment a sound came from heaven and the people were filled with the Holy Spirit, and how God removed all the gloom in that moment. Hallelujah. Isaiah 9, 1 says, But suddenly there will be no more gloom for the land that suffered. In one moment, God can take any situation and change it. He can take your depression. He can take your sadness. He can take your anxiety. He can take your sorrow. He can take your misery. He can take your despair. And in one single moment, you can be free and delivered out of it all. It will take that one moment, just a mindset change. Just the Lord quickening you on the inner man can completely make your life turn around. And you will suddenly see things for what they are truly are, instead of for what they have been to you. One instance, one moment, one encounter with the Lord. If we look at the life of Joseph, from the time that he was betrayed, hear me, from the time that he was betrayed, 22 years. From the time that his brothers sold him into slavery to the time that he revealed himself to his brothers was 22 years. Just imagine. Genesis chapter 37, reading from verse number 5. It says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain and out of the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around me and bowed down to me, his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and what had happened. Brothers and sisters, number one, do not tell everybody your dream. Do not tell anybody what the Lord has birthed in your heart. Not everybody, Christian or non-Christian alike, will be able to handle everything that the Lord has laid on your heart. We are our own worst enemy. We still have that to contend with. Because when we look at it, because it's impossible to us, we tend to self-sabotage. So we must be careful. That is something that we need to fight. Right? That is a personal journey for each and every one of us. Why do we need to put up with people's opinions about who we are? We must be very careful. It's not about the color of your skin, neither is it about your uh, a social status, neither is it about the money in the bank. When the Lord has called you, you are destined for greatness. There is nothing that you cannot accomplish. But not everybody is able 
to help that dream. In actual fact, they will help you sabotage yourself. So you've got to be careful. Some people are there scaffolding. They're there to support, to be alongside you, to walk with you, but only for a season. Not everybody is meant to be there forever. Not everybody is going to be a BFF. Joseph had every reason to give up. I mean, 22 years is a long time. 22 years. 13 years from the time that he was in fear of when he was with his brothers and he was sold into slavery to the time that Pharaoh called him to be the number one man in the land. That was a long time. But still a further few years before he revealed himself to his brothers. So the dream and the vision that God has given you is not necessarily for now, but now is the journey to there. It is, a, it is a process. It is something that grows and matures. And the one thing that the Lord is growing all the way, He's growing us. He's preparing us to fulfill that vision. Because in our current state, we may not have the maturity, the intellect, the understanding to know and to deal with what needs to come with that position. So God is preparing you. If you're going through trials and challenges and temptations and all that, understand that God is preparing you. Tell your neighbor, you're on your journey. And in one moment, Genesis 41, reading from verse 37, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, he says, can we find anyone like this man who, to whom the Spirit of God is with? And then Pharaoh turned to Joseph and he said, since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one so discerning as, and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. One moment. So the prisoner who was in jail now was transported to the palace. And now in one instant, the Lord turned it around. Now the prisoner became the ruler. Verse number 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it onto the prisoner's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, make way, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. In one moment, in one instance, God can turn everything around. When we look at the life of David, David was a teenager. He was anointed to be the next king of Israel. <laughs> and then he faced Goliath. He was then banished by Saul. He hid in the desert he lived on the run, forced out of the nations, and fought many battles. And it was nearly 15 years between the time he was anointed as king to the time that he was inaugurated as king. 15 years is a long time. And the Bible says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. This is in 2 Samuel. And the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Eli and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. And there was a valley that was between them. And then in verse number 4 it says, The champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. And Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up in battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man that he can come down to me. And if he is able to fight and kill me, we will be your subjects. 
For if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said that this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Oh, hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all of Israel were dismayed and terrified. Was he terrified of Goliath or was he terrified of the power that he would lose? Verse number 12. Now David was the son of the Ephraim named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And Jesse had eight sons. And in Saul's time, Jesse was very old. Now David was the youngest. Verse number 15. And then David went back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's sheep in Bethlehem. So in other words, at the time of war, the eldest three brothers joined Saul in the fight against the Philistines. David used to take things to the battlefront and used to then return to be the shepherd inside of uh, his homestead. Now, listen to this in verse number 16. For 40 days, the Philistines came forth every day and they took his stand. Now Jesse and his son David, he said, take this roasted grain and take 10 loaves of bread to your brothers. And he says, take some cheese for the commanders as well. See how your brothers are doing and bring back some assurances from them that they're okay. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the, in the land of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. And then the following morning, David left with the, clock, with the flock in care of the shepherd. Now hear me. Now, when David got to the battlefront, in verse number 21, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. And David left his things with the keeper of the supply and ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. So all David was doing was being obedient. Understand, there's no direct timeline between the time that David was anointed. David was anointed by Samuel at the age of 15. So when he defeated Goliath, it was somewhere between the age of 15 and the age of 19. It was still four years before he even faced Goliath. And now we don't know because the Bible doesn't say after he was anointed, what was the family dynamic like. He didn't say that everything was great and everybody celebrated. He didn't say that everyone gathered around him and started to celebrate him. Don't look for celebration when the word of the Lord comes. When the Lord sends somebody to give you the word of the Lord for you, do not take for granted that everyone is going to be happy. Do not expect everyone to be happy for who God is making you. Understand that the minute you know what the word of the Lord is to you and what the vision that God has for you is, it's going to be a process of time. Don't adjust your life there. Adjust your heart attitude with the Lord. That is what you adjust in preparing for the vision that God has called you for. Now in verse number 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how these men keep coming out? He comes here to defile Israel. And the king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. So there's David, anointed to be king, facing the reward of a king. As the youngest brother who's not prepared for battle, we're not sure if he's 15 or 19 years old. And here he was, he sees an opportunity. Brothers and sisters, seize the opportunities that present themselves when God brings it up. Take those opportunities. Don't look for convenience. Look for inconvenience because when you are following the vision that the Lord has laid on your heart, it's going to be inconvenient. It will be inconvenient. It will not be comfortable. It will mean that you will be leaving your house 
It will mean that you will now have to work odd hours. It means that now you'll have to sacrifice your time and resources in order. But the, but the opportunity is there. The Lord has presented the opportunity. That's why your vision and God's vision must be aligned. We align ourselves to what the vision of the Lord is for us. Because that is the time that we've been allotted. Okay? Now they repeated to him what they had seen and said and told him. This is what will be done for the man who kills. And when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speak to the men, he burnt with anger. And then he says to David, why did you come down there? Just like every good big brother should. Verse number 29. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? And then he turned to somebody else about the same matter. And verse number 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Verse number 33, and Saul replied, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young boy and you have been a warrior from your youth. And then verse number 34, now hear the words of David. Now this is why it is important for us to have our confidence in the Lord. Verse number 34, And David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord has rescued me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear. He will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Now where does that confidence come from? Is that arrogance? No. That comes from God's confidence. The spirit of the living God. The confidence that he had, that growing up, the difficulties that I have faced, the Lord has brought victory. And because he has brought victory, if he gave it to me then, he can give it to me now. And that is the confidence that he had. Brothers and sisters, is your confidence in the Lord or is your confidence in your own ability? And then Saul dressed David with his tunic. And then David said that he can't. This is not for him. And in verse number 45. (laughs) Okay, let's read from verse number 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him. Now, he's such a big man. Why did he need a shield bearer? Just by the way. He kept coming closer to David. And he looked David over. And he looked at this little boy glowing with health and handsome. (laughs) and he despised him and then he said to David am I a dog that you come to me with sticks and the Philistine cursed David by his gods he said come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals Mm. verse number 45 and David said to the Philistines you come against me with the sword and the spear and the javelin and I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of heaven's armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. And in verse number 50, and David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck the Philistine and he killed him. And David ran and he stood over him and he took hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it from its sheath and he killed him and he cut off his head. And when the Philistine saw the head and he saw that the hero was dead, they turned and they ran. And now all of a sudden, then the men of Israel and Judah surged toward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath. Where were they for the 40 days? Where were they for the 40 days when they they stood on the battle line? And here was this one man 
who stood before the entire army of Israel. And a little boy, with the confidence of God, came and changed everything. In the modern day term, we call that a disruptor. David came out of nowhere and changed it. He seized the opportunity. Prepare for the opportunity. How do we prepare for the opportunity? It means, brothers and sisters, in the difficulty that you face each and every day, in your day-to-day, -day, your mundane things, the 9 to 5, the 12 to 12, the 24-hour, prepare for the opportunity. Prepare for the battle that you do not see. Prepare for the time when the Lord will give you that opportunity because in that one moment in time, you will be ready for it. You won't fail. It's not about having the right words to say. It's not about being in the very best physical ability that you could be. It's not about having the best qualification possible. But in God's time, your confidence must be in Him so you'll be prepared for the time that He has called you. Hallelujah. And in verse number 55, Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine. And he said to Abner, the, uh, the commander of the army, he says, Abner, who is this young man? Right? In our colloquial term, who is this lighty? Just by the way, I even got called a lighty last night, just by the way. And Abner replied, as surely as I live, your majesty, I do not know. People who are older than you will look at you and say, ah, this one here, he has no idea. I am a seasoned person. I know. I've been doing this a long time. Brothers and sisters, the 15-year-old learnt more than the 50-year-old. The 15-year-old was prepared long before his time for such a time as this. Brothers and sisters, you are being prepared for such a a time as this. It will only take one moment, one instance, one situation will just turn like that. God will turn it around and you will be exactly where you're supposed to be. Don't live by the situation. Live by the preparation. Hallelujah. And then in verse number 56, he says, the king... Go and find out who this young man is. And as soon as David returned from killing the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul. And David took hold of the Philistine head. And David was around 15 years old when Samuel anointed him to be king. And in the midst of his brothers, Nochal, how, how, how much time has passed? David was anointed. Mm, he killed Goliath. And then God elevated him. So even though it was still a period of time before he became king, people knew him because he killed Goliath. The paw of the lion and the bear and the paw of Goliath. Isn't that amazing? So there will be times of significance in the midst of obscurity. There will be times of significance in the midst of everybody criticizing you, in the midst of everybody who thinks they know better than you, because God's timing is not man's timing. But understand that you are in preparation for where God wants to take you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Your vision, it leads to destiny. No vision, no destination. I said last week, we're not shooting blanks. We are preparing for war. Are you preparing for war? Every man, every servant of God, every leader, every president, every CEO, every person worth his salt, every king, every lion, every winner, every soldier, every person who has ever experienced any victory in his life, has experienced the urge to quit. 
quitting is easy. Running away from your problems is easy. Moving away from difficult people is easy. Not being confrontational is easy. Standing up for what is right and standing on the word of the Lord in the midst of obscurity and criticism is not easy. But brothers and sisters, you and I, we don't have the luxury to quit. If we truly want to be a person of significance and we truly want to fulfill what God has for our lives, we cannot quit. We don't have the luxury of quitting. We don't have the luxury of feeling sorry for ourselves. We don't have the luxury for blaming other people for our problems. We have to face Goliath. We need to cut off his filthy head. And we need to take that moment and seize that moment of significance onto exactly where God has called us to be. Hallelujah. We cannot give up on the dreams that God has given us. Remember I said last week that the vision that God has given us will be impossible to you and that is why you know it's God's vision. Anything that you can do in your own understanding, in your own ability is not the vision that God has called you for. God always calls you for something that is far greater than yourself. It might take us a long time to get there. It might take us 22 years. It might take us 15 years. It might take us 7 years. We may be in the prison right now. We may be running for our lives. They may be after us, but know that you have the Lord on your side. Know that difficulty will cease. Know that signs and <clears throat> the ability and the significance comes with God's calling. If you follow the vision that the Lord had given you, if you follow the vision and it is aligned with the Lord, I promise you that God is going to take you to where you're going to go. And he's going to give you the victory over the lion over the bear, and over the Goliaths. <clears throat> it's going to get uncomfortable, but we can't quit. It's going to be difficult, but we can't quit. It's going to mean that we're going to have no friends, <clears throat> but you can't quit. Because God is for you. He's anointed you. That in the midst of your obscurity, in the midst of a difficult family, in the midst of a mixed race, in the midst of a difficult country, God is still going to use you. He still called Samuel to anoint you. He still put his hand on you. He still put his spirit on you. You are called for something amazing. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread that he gives him a stone? God does not give you stones. He will never give you stones. It may not be the bread that you like. Because you may like white bread, but it gives you brown. You may not like brown bread, but it gives you whole wheat. And you may not like whole wheat, but then it gives you sourdough. But just know that he's giving you what's healthy for you. White bread. <laughs> Hallelujah. Enter by the narrow gate. Hmm. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. Brothers and sisters, we are the few. Because we choose God's way even though everybody is going in one direction. We do not have a herd mentality. We are a people who live our lives according to the word of God. 
we are a people who don't look for social status and we don't look for what's hip. We look for what is God's because we are God's. And if we are his prized possession and we are the people that he laid, that he, he gave us his son because he loves us so much and his, and his son, he sacrificed his own beloved son because he valued us so much. Why do you devalue yourself? Don't quit. Today is the last day of feeling sorry for yourself. Today is the day where we plug into the things of God. Today is the day where I switch off the music and I start putting on the Word of God. When I stop listening to the rap and to the war and the chaos of this world and I start to focus on the things of God. Today is the day where I'm going to put away childish things and start taking on the maturity that the Lord has laid up for my life. Today is the day where I'll have the, uh, where I will have the wisdom of Solomon, where I'll choose God's way and he will anoint me. Today is the day, like in James, where he says, ask for wisdom. Today is the day I choose the wisdom of Lord over the wisdom of TikTok. Today is the day where I'll no longer have social media telling me what my Christianity is about and I will know God for myself. Today is the day where I wake up in the morning and I start to prepare myself for the day ahead by spending time with my maker. I will stop looking for the blessing, but I will start looking for the one who gives the blessing. Today is the day where I will put away my childish behavior and I will make my house a house of prayer. Today is the day where I will make sure that there is no weather that will take me away from the house of the Lord. Today is the day where I will pull my children by the ears and make sure that they find themselves in the house of the Lord. Why? Because when I am no longer around, they will know how to stand on their own two feet. Hallelujah. Today is the day where I will start to be the disciple that God has called me to be and I will make disciples, telling people about the glory of God and what he has done in my life. Today is the day that I will be the man and woman that God has called me to be. That in spite of me being in debt, in spite of me not being able to completely put food on the table, today is the day I will tell them about what Jesus has done in the past so my future will be bright. Today will be that day. Today, I will not live through somebody else's salvation. I will live on my own salvation. Today is the day. I will no longer look at how much money is in the bank, but today is the day I will choose to put my reliance on the Lord. Today is the day that I will no longer be my own God, but I will allow God to move. Today is the day. Today is the day I am going to choose not to live in my own understanding, but I'm going to choose to live by the word of God. I will take the book of Psalms and I will worship the Lord. I will take the, the book of Proverbs and I'll start to make that my daily walk with the Lord. Today is the day. I may be working in checkers today, but God is preparing me to run in a management department tomorrow. Today is the day. Today is the day I will not live from paycheck to paycheck because my mentality is changing and the Lord is going to do something significant in my life. I may not have everything that I need right now, but I serve a God of more than enough. I serve a God that has a cattle of a thousand hills. There is no way in this life that I can fail because the Lord is on my side. But today I will stop trying to bring the money in and I'll allow God to bring the money in. Because just in that single moment in time, in that single moment in time, I'll tell you a little story because I'm getting ready to close. But I want to tell you a little story. Around about the time that I got married, I lost a contract. Contract was doing very, very well. And I lost the contract. And in one moment in time, there was almost 12, 12 million rand in debt. 12 million rand in debt. I never truly saw all of that even while doing the work is because they were paying me every 90 days. So you had to literally go and pull money out of everywhere to make this thing happen and eventually they pulled out the contract and there I was with 12 million rand debt. 
and no way to pay it. And I lived like that for five years. On the day that I got married, I could not pay for my own wedding. I actually wanted to call the wedding off. Yajna clapped me around the ear. She says, no, baby, you're stuck with me now. And you know what? It took more than seven years. When I got married, I couldn't even afford the wedding ring. Yeah. I know it don't seem like it now, but it's true. To this day, Yajin and I have not done a, a honeymoon. <laughs> Here's my wife there, you can ask her. But in that process of time, in one day, the Lord put every cent into my hand. And I remember the joy of walking into everywhere and just paying off the bill. Just like that. In one day, the Lord gave me every cent back and I was able to pay. And we're talking seven years of struggle, seven years of pain, seven years of difficulty. And the Lord provided for me. And I remember after every time I went to the place and I swiped the card, I even went to Absa Bank and I said, hey, you and me, we are no longer friends. Because I had, I mean, it got to a point where they took every vehicle and they had it sitting in their lot. But thanks be to God, I never got blacklisted. Thanks be to God that he kept me, he sustained me. Thanks be to God. Eventually, they did have to pay me back the money and I paid everything off. Hallelujah. But the feeling of walking in today and becoming debt free just in an instant. Because understand, the minute that the money hit my account, the status changed. Was I expecting the money to come? No. It got paid outside of court. But you know when I released that? Because even after I was married, I was very bitter because I said, how could this happen to me? How many people are asking that question now? How could this happen to me? I do everything right. I go to church. I pay my tithes. I do all of this right. And still this happened to me. What did I do wrong? But the Lord was preparing me for something far greater because the amount of money that we have handled since then has far superseded that 12 million rand. Hallelujah. But that is the status when God changes your status, no man. And the guys that pulled the contract from me, one ended up in a mental institution, the other guy got fired and ended up in jail himself. Yeah. Now, that was my lion and that was my bear. That was my lion and that was my bear. And then when the, when the opportunity presented itself, then I stood there and I said, me, in my father's house, I was a shepherd. I looked after the sheep. And when I went out, when the lion and the bear came to steal the sheep and carry them away, I went to look. And God gave me victory over the lion and the bear. Brothers and sisters, you are sitting here today because the Lord delivered you from something. And because he delivered you from something, let me tell you, you have the ability. That was him showing himself strong to you. So whatever that difficulty is you're facing today, whether it's you're facing with the deadly disease, whether you're faced with debt that you have no idea how I'm going to pay, stop trying to pay the bill. Hear me? Stop trying to pay the bill. How about you allow God to be God? Listen, we've done everything we could in our own understanding. But in an instant, the Lord can change everything. The Lord can give you joy. He can give you freedom far beyond your years. Far beyond your years. Far beyond your understanding. Can you imagine in one instant he can take you from where you are? If your child is sick today and the doctors have no idea how they're going to fix it. Even if you're a doctor and, you could, and you've done everything that you know to do. You've, you have gone to every research, you've gone to every facility, you've done everything. How about you say, thank you Lord Jesus for my child's healing. 
Go and lay your hands, put the anointing oil on your child, and as a family, you'll agree that today my child is going to be healed. And now you leave it in the Lord's hand, and you stop trying to do what you're going to do and allow God to be God. I promise you God's going to bring you victory. If you're sitting with a million rand debt today, not because you did something wrong, but because somebody either did you down or life happened and you had circumstances and things, it doesn't matter how it came. But if we have a father who, is a, who has a cattle of a thousand hills, brothers and sisters, what can't he deliver you from? Because remember, we may be a slave to a Babylonian system, but God, by his mercy and his grace and his supply, and because you are his kid, what can't he take you out of? In one instant, he can literally just take away the debt just like that. You all know the testimonies. People have had their, uh, their rates and their light bulbs have gone up to hundreds of thousands of rent. In an instant, God pays those things off. Those are the miracles. Tap into that. Tap into that. Follow the principles of the Lord and let him work on your behalf. High five your neighbor. Say, God's going to work on you. God's going to give you that victory. God's going to take you from where you, from where you are to where you're going to be. If you're sitting in a job and you've been there for 10 years and nobody's promoted you and every Tom, Dick and Harry that has come after you has been promoted, but there you are. Brothers and sisters, you're not only going to get that promotion, but you'll end up running that company. Listen, listen. God can take you from being a clerk. He can take you to senior management. God can take you from senior management to CEO. God can take you from CEO to part partner. God can change you to owner. Stop limiting God. Stop limiting God. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. You may be standing there alone. You may be feeling like God is not on your side. Brothers and sisters, God has been carrying you all this time. He's been carrying you. You don't have to do this on your own strength. Allow the Lord to move on your behalf. Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. One word, one moment in time. God has the power to change everything. Everything. Put your hand like this. Say, everything. Full circle. Everything. God's going to take me through everything. God's going to give me deliverance. He's going to turn me around through everything. There's nothing I can face that He can't fix. But we need to plug in. We need to tap in. We need to get back to the things of God. The things that we used to do, we need to start doing. Get back to church. We need to start doing, making sure that we're paying our tithes. Making sure, not looking at the money in the bank, saying, hey, you know what? I don't think I can pay tithes this month. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. That's exactly where the devil likes you. He likes you there because he likes to work in those things. We say we love the Lord, then we must give to the Lord what is the Lord's. Full stop. We don't look at what's in the bank. We look at what's the Lord. Because God can change everything in an instant. In an instant. We're not looking for who we know and what we know. We're not looking for the uncle with the money. Now we're going to go borrow from him. Eh, eh. No way, Jose. Uh-uh. Finito. Finito. We allow the Lord to move. Amen? Hallelujah. I don't know what happened to you. You just fell down off the bus there. Right? So one word, one moment. God has the power to change everything. The question is, brothers and sisters, will we allow the Lord to change? Will we make space enough to unlimit God in our lives? Hear me, in our thinking, will we allow God to move? Will we stop limiting God by our thoughts, our imaginations, our works and our frustrations and allow God to move beyond that? Or will we stand on our own strength and limit God? Mm. We will not. Say, I will not limit God. We as a house, we as a family, we as a couple, me as a man, me as a woman, me as a child of God, I will not limit God. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Mm. 
And in closing, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst yourselves. And make music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, do not entertain frivolous conversations. When you walk into the lift and somebody says, Ah, oh Jesus, you know, they curse in his name. What do you do? You start singing a praise song. You start speaking in tongues. You start letting them know. Then they ask you, how, what happened? They say, no. Well, if you decided that you were going to curse in God's name, then I'm going to decide to praise in his name. When they say, yeah, you know, this government is so corrupt. Yes, it's okay. But you know what? God placed me here and I'm going to do everything that I need to do. I will pray for my government as his word declares. This is a prosperous nation. This is a nation that loves God. This is a God that loves this nation. We change it around. We change it around. We do it with our words. We do it in our actions. We do it in our everyday lives. We walk this walk. We talk this talk. We live this life and allow God to move. Hallelujah. So I declare over the people of God, debt cancellation in the name of Jesus. Every clothing bill, every furniture bill, every rates bill, every lights and water bill, every bill that is out of our control, every high interest loan, every loan that was taken in the name of Jesus, I declare it debt free, paid off supernaturally in the name of Jesus. I declare every sick person, every person with an ailment, every person with some sort of disease that requires management, every cancer, every HIV, in the name of Jesus, freedom from that sickness, freedom from that disease, every knee shall bow, every filthy spirit, every demonic spirit working in God's people lives right now in the name of Jesus. We are free. We are the healed of the Lord. We live in divine health all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. I de declare every broken home. Every home where there is no dad anymore. The dad is gone to be with the Lord. Every home with an abusive parent. Every home where the father and mother are divorced. I declare this day that Lord you will intervene on the family's behalf. Father, that you will bring restoration in its various forms in the name of Jesus into those homes. I declare every home where there is no food that from today there will never be a cupboard that is empty. Lord, you will supernaturally supply every need in every area. You will bring what is necessary by whomever necessary to bring supply into that home in Jesus' mighty name. I declare every, every shoe to be souls without way. Like how the children of Israel walked where their shoes did not wear, their sandals did not wear. Let it be so in this house. That things will last beyond the expiration date. That things will be far more, far more able to accomplish what we have set it to do in Jesus' mighty name. I declare that every child here will grow up in the ways of the Lord. We will never have distracted children. We will never have children from this day forward that will be on drugs. But we will have children that will be set apart, set for the Lord, 
to accomplish the will of God for their lives and for our generations in the name of Jesus. Every generational curse be broken now in the mighty name of Jesus. We declare in our homes that the generational curses are broken. Whether it be broken homes, whether it be alcoholism, whether it be a fatherless or a motherless home, that is broken now in the name of Jesus. The Lord is giving us the victory. The Lord has given us the victory. That in our homes we will declare the word of the Lord and show, so it shall be. That as we speak, as we agree upon anything, that it shall come to pass in our homes in the name of Jesus. When we break bread, may the Holy Spirit come upon every situation. Let the Holy Spirit find every dark avenue and take away the darkness and bring the light of God into every area in Jesus' mighty name. How do you say? Hallelujah! How do you say? Amen and amen, so shall it be in the name of Jesus. You are blessed beyond measure. You are blessed beyond measure. We no longer look at situations. We look at the God. We no longer look at circumstance. We look at God. We allow God to move in our homes. When there's a situation, we don't find how we're going to fix it. We find ourselves at the dining room table. We put everybody around the table. We write it down like a contract, what we want God to believe, a prayer of agreement. And then we all sign it and then we seal it with the precious blood of Jesus and allow the Lord to move. This is what supernatural living is, brothers and sisters. We all have to do it. Because the devil likes us. We don't have to be serving him, but he likes us in a place where we do nothing about it. We just live through the circumstance. No. I say no. Do you say no? We refuse in the name of Jesus. No. We refuse to allow him to run rampant in our homes. God is going to move supernaturally. Our children will do far beyond. They will do supernaturally well in school. Those that have difficulty with maths will be the mathematicians. Those that have uh, struggles in physics, they will be the physicians. They will be the scientists. They will be the history makers. They'll be those world changers. Come on. If you have younger children, start declaring that. I don't care whether they're running around and they can't sit still. Start declaring the word of the Lord. Start putting your hands on them. And it doesn't matter which country you are in the world. The process is the same. It's the same God. There's no God in America, then a God in China, and then a God in Japan, and then a God in Jamaica. No, it's the same God. He made the heavens and the earth. And if He has our best interest at heart, then we should love the Lord with all our heart. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. So may the Lord richly bless you. May He cause His face to shine on you. May He give you peace in every area of your life. In the name of Jesus. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one. Victory. Let these moments come to pass in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. I'll see you all on Tuesday morning. To those watching via online, God bless you. It was wonderful to have you. Put a, put a like or a comment or something in the description and we will then respond back to you. We have a free gift for you and we want to bless you. If you haven't downloaded our mobile application, FCI Online, you can find it on any of the app stores. Go and download it. There's some wonderful material there and we look forward to seeing you on the prayer meeting on Tuesday morning, 5 to 6. God bless you. Bye-bye.